Start recording. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about wet flies. It's fairly simple, straightforward wet flies. Uh, and the most simple one uh, is, is the first one which I, I showed earlier, which is this guy here. And that's a uh, black dubbing with a uh, darling hackle. And tied, that's on a size 12 uh, scud type hook. Um, but I'm gonna tie the next one up, which, and, and we're gonna talk about different kinds of hackle. So starling, this is what starling comes like. You can see it's got some nice markings on it. And there's a range of feather sizes from really tiny to reasonably sized. Uh, you get them in this little package. Uh, the next one I'm gonna do is, is a partridge in orange. And this is the partridge. It comes in package like that, or you can get it right off the bird. Um, and what I do is I, I select a hackle that by taking the, the bare hackle off the neck and then stroking it backwards, it causes the fibers to stick out to the side. And then I will measure the fibers up against the hook. Now, for these classic wet flies, typically the hackles are one and a half to two times the gap of the hook. And sometimes I just measure them for shank length uh, if I have the right sized hook. So when I, when I take that, the first thing you do is to prepare the hackle is you strip all the fuzz off the bottom, except I'm hanging on up to a little bit here to make it easier for the hackle pliers to grab. And then I will strip off all of the long fuzzy feathers that are too long for the hackle that I want to tie. And then I'll, I'll have about a shank length worth of hackle fiber sticking out the side. And that's all I'm going to use to wrap around the hook shank. And I leave this little tag in here because that's how we're going to tie it in. So I'll set that aside. And I'm going to get my orange eight aught thread. And I'm going to start right behind the eye. And I'm going to wrap back a bit and trim the excess. And I'm not gonna go much further back on this short shank hook than a, about halfway. Dubbing. This is possum, awesome possum. And I like the possum because it's got, this particular brand has fairly fine fibers in it, but it's got a little bit of spiky bit. And it's, it's not too spiky and it's fairly easy to get dubbed onto the thread. So I'm going to pull a small amount out of my box here, the Spencer box, and I'm just going to pull about three inches of thread out, lay this stuff up against the thread, a little bit of wet on my fingers, and I'm going to spin counterclockwise, thumb and forefinger around the thread. And I'm going to keep, you can see, there's not a lot of hack or, or, of dubbing on that thread. I wanna keep it fairly skinny noodle of thread. And the reason for that is it helps me control the size of the bump. And for these real simple ones, the bump behind the hackle is primarily there to spread the hackle out so that it breathes in the water. And you can see that I'm leaving maybe one and a half to two eye widths behind the eye. Now, I'm not gonna go down for these real simple ones. I'm not gonna go down the hook shank and uh, trim it, trim it uh, and sorry, cover the hook shank. I'm gonna leave the bare shank. So all this, this bump is is to give a little color and to allow the hackle to spread out. I'm going to take my uh, prepared hackle and I'm going to tie it in curved side facing away from me by the tip. So I'm going to lay this down so that the tip is right parallel to the shank on the near side, the stem on the near side, 
make a loose wrap over so that the, the hackle stands up like that. I'm gonna do a couple of solid wraps and then I'm gonna take the tip and pull it back and do a couple of wraps in front. And that's important with these little hackles because that locks the hackle in so that when you start wrapping the hackle, it's not gonna come undone. I'm gonna take that tip and I'm gonna pull it forward and I'm gonna trim it off. Get my other scissors. I'm gonna get in here, get the regular hackle out of the way. And I'm just gonna trim this tip off. Now if that's locked in there, it's not gonna come undone. And I'm gonna take my hackle pliers and I like these Griffin style rotating hackle pliers because they allow you to get the feather in the right position. So I'm gonna bring the thread forward just a little bit behind the eye, out of the way, wet my thumb and forefinger and I'm gonna hold the hackle straight up get thumb and forefinger and stroke those fibers towards the rear of the hook. This is called folding the hackle around the stem. And then I'm gonna hold them in that position as I start the wrap. Wrap it around the bottom, bring it around the near side and stroke it again, making sure all the fibers are pointing back. And I'm going to do another one and then when I get to the end of that hackle, the stem should be right on top of the hook. I'm gonna come in and put the thread in between the hackle and the stem a couple of times. I'm gonna do the same thing, wrap in front two or three times. I'm gonna come in and snip that stem off. Stroke all these fibers back and I'm gonna make a little head. This adds a little bit of color. And the other thing does is it forces the hackles towards the rear of the hook. And then I'm gonna whip finish. So this first hackle is partridge. Come in here and get the thread off. Come on, get in there. The wrong there you go. And I'm just gonna do a little dab of glue on the front. This is Sally Hansen's Hard as Nails, which I really like. Makes the head just a teeny bit shiny. And because you're working in tight quarters, so I get glue in the eye. That's where the uh, little piece of hackle stem that I cut off comes in handy. I can uh, carefully put it in the eye of the hook. And what that does is that cleans the glue out of the eye so it doesn't get plugged up when you go to fish. So that's a partridge and orange. Very simple. Uh, very effective little fly in the early spring, I find in the early spring when there's lots of little midges coming off. Now, the next one. Wet fly, Dave? That's a partridge in orange. Wet? Wet. Yeah. Simple wet fly. It, 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 it uh, imitates a, a, a midge, emerging, emerging midge. I'm gonna put those away. Now, I won't tie the also second. Also works very well with caddis. Yeah. If you have a small caddis hatch, uh, a partridge and orange in a slightly larger size is. I, I used to use those in the spring floor and at Beaumont Pond. It, it really early spring when they were. Oh was... yeah, they they work for midges. You want you want the smaller size like 16s yeah. and stuff. Yeah, size 16. Yeah. Yeah, but if you want a a harder 12, to find it's for bigger. Now, I'm not going to tie this one. I'm just going to give you a look at 
so that's cartridge. Now the other one that I was going to talk about is gross. That's that's a package of gross. And gross tend to be bigger, so you tend to use those on larger flies. And so you can see the difference between the partridge and the gross. This has a lot more firm markings. Dave? Yes. Sorry, just a question uh, on the previous fly or generally on all these flies. What uh, size range do you typically tie yours in for fishing in, uh, in this? Well, well, unlike the, these little guys, like the, the, the black and starling, I'll, you can tie those down to size 18s, maybe if you're really good 20s, uh, okay. because you can get feathers that small. Okay. With partridge, you're going to be lucky if you can get down to an 18, a proper feather in a size 18. Mm -hmm. And it's even worse with grouse. grouse uh, the grouse that I've got don't go that small. So normally I would tie grouse on a size 10 or even a 12. Uh, getting sh long, short enough fibers. So the way it comes is this is this is the basic uh, the basic feather, and it has this, all this fuzz on the bottom. And then what I do is I leave the fuzz to start with and strip back until I find the barbules that suit the hook size. And then once I've done that, I strip all the fuzz off, and I strip the amount of feather that I'm going to use and I'll I guess I will tie this one might as well get it in the hook in the vise um, because the other trick I want to show you is is how to do a single-sided hackle which I'll use for the the other one do you ever uh, trim the the barbules uh, to shorten them to uh, to tie smaller flies no no that they they lose the the flexibility at the tip. Yeah, okay. So again, I'm gonna start in the front. There is a trick you can do, uh, and and I, I would say just go and watch the Davy McPhail video where he cuts partridge fibers, spins them on the hook, and then folds them back. Yeah. And the resulting fly is not too bad looking. It, it probably requires you to watch more than once. I, I have to go back and look at it again. Oh, I think oh. That's, that's the one where he ties it facing forward and then folds it back over itself. Exactly that one, yes. Yeah, I've seen that, that's right. And yeah. I've tried to, to tie some uh, hackle fibers that way uh, and it worked. I wasn't doing a partridge in orange. I tried it on another fly and it, it's a good idea. So now this, this one is going to use a, a longer orange body, and this would be less of a midge and more of a, a traditional wet. I'm going to give it a orange body with thread, a little longer. I'm going to come back about halfway down. I'm going to use the same dubbing. And again, I'm going to put it on the hook so that it's pretty fine and thin on the thread. And I'm gonna start about halfway down the body so that you end up with kind of an orange tag. And then you're gonna end up with a skinny body. And I'm gradually gonna make that skinny body a little bigger. And then again, when I get to the point where I'm going to tie the hackle in, I'm going to make this dubbing bump, which again, keeps the hackle spread when, and, and allows it to breathe when you're stripping. I make that bump right about there. Just need a teeny bit more. And you can put a, uh, you can put a silver rib on that if you want. Um, to add a little more interest to it. Then I'm going to take my prepared hackle and I'm going to put it up against the hook again so that the tip is facing forward and it's curved away from me. And I'm going to do a single sided hackle. So I've, I've got it prepared as if it's a double sided. But what I'm going to do is hold on to the tip I'm going to take the stuff on the top of the hackle with thumb and forefinger, and I'm going to gently 
strip those oh, fibers no. off the stem of the hackle. So now I have yeah. a half a hackle. Yeah. I have a half a hackle. And I'm going to touch that down the same way I did the other one, except there's only half a hackle here. Bring that tip up. And this time it's going to be a little easier to trim the tip out. Bill, can you hear that down? Sorry. Hackle plier. So these are essential techniques if you're going to tie any of these old English style wet flies. Being able to do this folded hackle. Now with this one, you're not folding it. You're just making sure that the little bit of hackle that sticks out goes towards the back as you wrap the stem. And it's a very sparse hackle. I get there, I'm gonna tie off the butt end of the fiber, fire feather and trim that out. And make a head. So these things, once you prep the fibers, the feathers, and, and get, it, get it set up, if you do that ahead of time, you can knock these out pretty fast. Oh, that blew it on for the time being. So there's another partridge in orange, but it's it's more of a classic wet style and tied very sparse hackle. You can see the barring on the hackle is different from the partridge. All right. Now we'll get into the major, main pattern, major pattern, which combines this and a couple of other techniques. So you've look, you've seen starling as a hackle, and you've seen grouse as a hackle, uh, and you've seen partridge. But one of the nicest products on the market for hackle, if you're tying slightly larger flies, is this pheasant stuff the pheasant neck stuff. Um, and I've got a bunch of these prepped. I'll show you that in a minute. Where we're going. But the other th material that I wanted to show you today is hen necks. And they're cheap. They come in a thing like that. That's the, off of a neck of a hen, obvious for the name. And they come in a variety of colors. I, the ones I got in my hand here, this is maybe a third of what I have in terms of different colors. Uh, these ones are, are brown with a black center. Got this one, which is white with a bit of a, a tan or a goldish edge to it. I'm gonna use that one. There's this guy here, which is a little bit further down the hen cape. It's got some longer feathers. You can get them white. That's almost pure white. I think those are dyed. And what I'm gonna use for this fly is, is sort of a gray with a little bit of a darker center. Um, and they're a, they're a great material to use for both hackles and for wings. So for this fly, I'm going to use a uh, Yamco 200R hook. And the R is the uh, ring eye version. Just need to find the right hook. It's a, it's a 2x long hook. So it's got a fairly long body, two or three x long. And I'm going to put that in the vise and I'm going to kind of bury the hook point because I'm, when I tie the hackle, I'm going to want to brush it back. And if I do, I'll poke my finger on that point. Um, same thread, so I'm gonna start the thread right behind the eye. It's an uh, orange six aught. I'm off the tag. Ah, the, uh, the tail for this guy is, once again, like last week, it's this stuff, it's golden pheasant crest. 
because it gives a nice orange tail with a, uh, I got all these hackles prepped, so I'll get them out. So you don't have to watch me wrestle with selecting hackles and wings. <laughs> Um, so what I have is a, a piece of pheasant crest there. And what I'm going to do is just very slightly pull away a batch of them to make a tail. And I'm not going to pull them hard at right angle. I'm gonna, not going to pull them hard at right angles because that will misalign the fibers. I want the black tip and the black band in the middle to stay there. I'm going to run my thread down the hook. I'm going to run it all the way down to the end, right to the bend over top of where the barb was before I mashed it down. And I'm going to get my scissors here and I'm going to trim this off the stem of the golden pheasant tip. I'm gonna lay the feather down so that the first black bar of the feather is just behind the end of the hook. I'm gonna hold it down with the left hand, do a pinch wrap, get it on there securely. And then I'm gonna wrap forward over the butts. Not gonna bother trimming them to the halfway point. That's the tail. The rib is going to be uh, silver. Uh, I have this two-sided uh, tinsel. It's flat tinsel. And so I'm gonna take a length of that off the spool. And turn it off. Now, when I tie this down on the hook, I'm gonna want a silver rib. So the way I do it is I, I tie it so that the gold portion side of the, is facing me. So when I tie it onto the, onto the hook shank, the gold side is facing me. Ah, come on, get on there. Once again, I have to take the twist out of my thread there. There we go. Then I've got the gold side facing me and I'm going to wrap, ah, uh, come on, you didn't do that, right? Let's try again. Gold side out. There we go. Gold side out. And I'm going to wrap it down the hook shank so that it is on top and then just lightly on the far side. And I'm going to tighten that right down to where I attached the tail. That's my rib. And now when I start wrapping it, because the gold side's on top, that first wrap is going to roll it over so the silver's on the outside. The body is floss. And in this case, it's a uh, it's an orange floss. I'm gonna get a chunk of that off. And I probably don't need a huge chunk. Probably about a hand's length. I'm gonna bring my thread back up all the way up the shank of the hook to about four eye widths behind the eye of the hook. I'm gonna lay that down, make two soft loops. I'm gonna see my brother here. And then I'm gonna, as, as I've got that, I don't have to trim it, I just draw it back so that it's now on the hook. <laughs> Wrap over top of that stuff all the way back to the same place as I had the tinsel and the tail tied in. So that's my uh, body material. I'm gonna bring my thread forward 
because I'm using a rotary vise, we're going to throw a half hitch here. Too much coffee this morning. Get on there. And that just keeps that thread from raveling when I do my body. There you go. I'm going to take my uh, tinsel out of the way. Out of the way. There. And then this first wrap of thread, of, of floss, is right on top of that. Now you see that this frost will go flat if you allow it to. It'll spread out. See how it's spreading out? It, it makes a nice smooth body if you let it spread out and don't let it rope up on you. And then as I get forward, I'm just gonna overlap it a teeny bit to make that body a little bit tapered so that it gets a little fatter as I go towards the front of the fly. And when I get to that point, four eye widths behind the eye, I want to leave some room because I've got a little more that's going to go on up here with the wings and tackle. Put my thread through that V that it makes, which the material makes with the hook again. And then again, I'm going to wrap, hold it back and wrap in front to lock it in. Come down and trim off my excess. There go. Once again, um, I'm going to do is throw a half hit here because I'm going to use the rotary feature on my vise to get a nice even wrap of the rib up the body of the fly. So I'm going to hold this thing up at a about a 30 degree angle to the shank of the hook. And I'm going to rotate the vise. Need to adjust the light here. It's in the way. So you can see what's going on. As I hold it at a constant angle, it's going to make a nice even silver rib up that body of the fly. That's the beauty of a rotary vise. It, it allows you to make those kinds of nice, smooth, even wraps up the fly. Tie it off in front as well and trim the tinsel out. That's it for the rotary part. Now what I'm gonna do here is just smooth out the portion here about four eye widths behind where I'm now going to tie in the hackle. And the hackle is a hand hackle. Comes off the, the sorry, part, a pheasant. It's going to come off of this uh, pheasant body here. And it looks the same as, as the other feathers in that it has a, uh, has a, a sort of an oval shape to it. And I'm gonna to try to pick one that I have, again, about a shank length worth of fibers sticking out. And I should have one prepped in here. Maybe I don't, yes I do, I have one prepped. Great. So I've done the same thing with this as we did with the partridge and, and grouse, is I've figured out how much I need for length and I, have stripped off the fuzz off the bottom, leaving a little handle to work with. And I'm once again going to hold that so that the curved part faces away from me and the tip faces forward. And again, I'm not gonna make a robust tackle, it's gonna be sparse. So I'm gonna take off the top of the hackle that's hanging there. I'm gonna strip it off and I have to be careful here because this is a very fine stem. One of the things I noticed with COVID and with uh, 
having to wash your hands all the time is when I try to strip this hackle, I just don't have enough stick in my fingers anymore because of all the hand washing. <laughs> I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna lay this down on the hook with the tip forward and make a loose wrap or two. I'm gonna hold the tip up and wrap in front. And then I'm gonna get my scissors in here and I'm gonna trim out the tip. Hackle pliers again. Grab this thing here by the hackle pliers, by the butt. Oh, come on. Where's my little, I'm having trouble seeing this morning. That's better. And once again, I'm going to make sure when I wrap this hackle, I've got all of the fibers facing the rear of the hook. And I'll probably, with this length, I'll probably get four, maybe five wraps. Again, always trying to keep those hackle fibers going to the back. And then when I run out of fibers, I will tie it off. I can see that I've got a few mallards sticking forward. So I'm gonna stroke those back. I'm gonna make a nice little platform. Now you see I've left a good two eye widths behind the eye of the hook. And the reason for that is I need a place to attach my wings. Now the wings also came off the, uh, the neck of the bird. And you can see this one I've got, this is gonna be a white wing. So I've selected two that are about the same size and shape. That one's a little bigger. There we go. These two are about the same. So try to match those in terms of size and shape. And then what I, I do with these is the same thing as I've done before, is I'm gonna strip off the fuzzy bits from the bottom. And again, being very careful because this, these stems on the hand hackles are quite delicate. Out of there. I need to get bare stem. There we go. There we go. So that's one. And I need to do the other one at the same time because I want these to be matched in terms of length. The way to do that is get the stem cleaned. And I'm going to hold them up to one another. And by gum, I got lucky. They're both, they're both the same length and shape. So now I'm gonna take this prepared feather, I'm gonna push these hen feathered hackles down a bit so that they're all below the shank of the hook. I'm gonna place the feather on the far side of the hook with the tip to the rear and the stem in the front. And I'm gonna lay it down at about a 45 degree angle with the end of the feather just about where the hackle is. And I'm going to wrap over that stem with two light wraps. And I'm gonna stop there. Because what I wanna do is I can work this stem back and forth and into position so that the hackle is now on the side of the hook and it's a little bit above. I can adjust that so that the stem is pointing up a little bit. The hackle's facing away from me, cupped over the hook. And then I'll give a good solid wrap or two to lock it in place. Lift up the butt, wrap in front, 
to lock it in and trim off the stem. I'm going to take my other feather and I'm going to lay that on the near side in a similar fashion. And I'm going to try and match up where the ends of the tips are. Again, tits slightly away from me, over top of the hook. Hold it with the left hand, a couple of light wraps. Two. And then I'm going to wiggle the stem in there and try to get it so that it matches the layout on the far side of the hook. Now that didn't work because I pull them up. There we go. And then I'm going to pull it forward just so that the stems line up. And then I'm going to make the good solid wraps again. I'm just going to pull these up just and, and hold them up a little bit. Give a little bend to the stem. And I'm going to wrap in front and trim off that tip. Trim off the butt stem. So now you see I've got them located on each side, matched up, pointed slightly up above the tail at the back. And now I can whip, make my head. And these guys can have a nice little tapered head. They, uh, they look a little nicer with a tapered head. And when I get that done, make sure the feathers are in the right place. I'm going to tie a whip finish. I'm going to do one whip finish. And then I'm going to glue it. And I'll show you the trick with the gluing. So now with the hackles in place and I get them oriented properly and matched up, I'm going to come in with my glue, turn it sideways, come in with my glue and I'm going to put just a little bit of glue on the head and just far enough back that it catches a little bit of that wing. I'm going to flop it over the other side and do the same thing on the other side. Catch the head and a little bit of the glue back so it catches the wing. And what that glue does on catching it on the wing is it, when it hardens, it holds the wing in place. And use my bodkin just to make sure I don't have any glue in the eye. And he is done. The nice thing about these hen hackles is that they they are a little delicate when you catch a fish. So you want to probably tie several of these. Um, but what it does is it it breathes in the water. It, it slims down and it breathes. It makes a very nice looking, very attractive fly. And the, the red with these light wings, the, the orange and the rib show through. So there you go. A classic English wet fly with hen wings. <coughs> so, what is it called? It's just a hen wing wet fly. And you can do it in all sorts of different colors with different hackles. They make pretty fly. There you go. So, Florin, you're on. You're muted. No longer muted, I guess. There you go. Okay, so I'm going to uh, try to show you what I'm going to do. Well, I've sent you pictures already, so you've, you've seen those. So the idea here is, and let me get this sharing going. Okay, so can everybody see this? 
Okay, so this is a fly that, uh, again, I don't know what got into me to do this fly because I'm sure you know way more about it than I do. This is uh, what's called an American coach, but apparently it's a BC fly. Um, and the origin story, according to Art Lindgren's book, is some fellow on the island found this fly in a shop in Courtney and then tried to find a name for it and named it American Coachman. There you go. Um, anyway, it's um, if you remember the Western Coachman that Dave did uh, a week or two ago, uh, it's basically the same fly with a different set of materials. And it's supposed to be a cutthroat fly, and it comes in several variants. And uh, the variants are, I'm going to do kind of the full, um, the full works, and then tell you the various things that can be dropped along the way or, um, or substituted in various, in various ways. So as you can see, uh, this one has a red tail, um, gold ribbing, some yellow material for the body and uh, brown hackle and the white wing. In this case, um, I have some polar bear. So let's, um, mm. let's get going with the fly. The steps are all familiar by now. And I'm doing this as, as, as part, of a, part of a series of, of flies. Um, Next, my, uh, my goal is to, uh, to show a, a Peter Ross, which is another classic wet fly. That's a bit fancier than, than this one. So I, I thought I'd, I'd start with, the, with easier stuff. Um, and then at some point I suggested to Dave that we, uh, re we repeat the, uh, the muddler minnow, or in this particular case, I was interested in, in doing, uh, he can do the, uh, the full muddler and I can do the uh, simpler looking uh, rolled muddler, which is another, which is another BC pattern for, for, for Siron cutthroats. So this is a size, um, size 10 hook. It's a, it's a token stainless steel salt water hook. It is for all intents and purposes, the same shape as the Mustad 34007 and it's also a little less less expensive plus you guys get a I think you get a discount at tokens so uh, it's it's right right in your backyard um, the hooks I've, I've tied on a on a few size eight hooks I kind of like them. Um, the one thing that I found a little bit challenging with these hooks is when you pinch the barb on them, it breaks off and leaves a little rough spot. So yep. what I end up doing, and I do actually the same thing with the Mustad hooks in, in larger sizes, when I, when I pinch the barb on these hooks to get a true barbless, then after pinching, I take a file I put the hook in the vise and I file away the leftover uh, nub there. Alternatively, you could go and buy fancy hooks that are already barbless and salt water and everything, um, but I don't have any of those. So this is, this is what I'm using. The thread is, um, is an eight aught, which may seem a little thin for this, but uh, it does allow for more for more wraps of thread, so you have a little bit more um, more freedom to do things. Now the tail, um, any red material I think would do. Uh, what I'm using here is I have some uh, red dyed uh, schlappen that I actually picked. It was beautiful red. Um, I picked this up at uh, at Robinson's in Victoria uh, a few years ago. It's really good stuff. Um, the recipe calls for, you know, red ibis, red swan, uh, I mean, swan dyed red, obviously. Um, you can use uh, duck, feathers, goose, whatever you happen to have in, in red. Uh, red calf as well would work. I suppose red wool as well as, as on a woolly worm. So what I do with this 
And this is fairly, uh, fairly thin stuff. So what I do is I take a section of fibers and I try to have the tips somewhat aligned and I pull, <coughs> I pull the fibers perpendicular to the stem. I grab them in my hand and just yank. Okay, so I end up with a, with a bundle of fibers that I'm, I'm going to roll a little bit in the hand to get them into a slightly thicker, thicker bundle. Then I'm going to measure length of the hook shank. I'm going to trim excess here anyway, because I don't need all that. And I'm going to attach this to the hook. So 45 degree, let the thread grab the fibers and, and move the bundle on the top and then for safety, just go back with a couple of, of wraps. So now I've got a tail on. Then I'm going to put on some ribbing. And for ribbing, I'm using, so for this, this size of hook, this is about as big as it can handle. So a size 14 uh, mylar tinsel. It's again what the, the stuff Dave was using earlier, the, the double-sided, right? One side silver, one side gold. I want the gold. So I'm going to tie with the silver facing me and just attach it to the hook. The thread is going to roll this on the hook, but that's okay as well. Just going to let this hang here on the vise. I have it on the, on the spool, which is what I prefer to do. And this is why if I'm going to ever decide to learn to tie um, on a rotary vise, that's going to be a challenge. I haven't figured out a solution to this problem. Okay, now the next material is for the body. And what I have here is slightly irreproducible. It's a scrap of um, wool that is dyed in this kind of wacky changing color. This is sock wool. And I believe this particular bit of sock wool, uh, you have several wonderful um, wool shops in, in Victoria where you can supply yourselves with, with good stuff like this. I think this particular one came from, uh, from Copenhagen ages ago. Um, well, my <laughs> it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a story be, behind every scrap of wool that my wife buys, right? So these have been turned into uh, baby caps for friends. Um, there's there's got to be a pair of socks uh, floating out somewhere, you know, um, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, I like it because it's a very beautiful yellow. Um, it's kind of a it's it's not a, a very strident yellow. It's 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 got a slightly uh, buttery 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 color to it. And if I'm very very lucky, there's a spot of red right at the tail where I where this thing can can blend in with with the red tail. So anyway, I start I start wrapping the the wool on the on the hook at the tail. Standard procedure here, nothing fancy. Just try to do an even body because otherwise the tinsel is going to go all over the place. Okay, so leave some space at the eye of the hook, trim the wool, tidy up a little bit, and then do about three wraps of the, three wraps of the tinsel, you know, is plenty enough. This is not supposed to be overkill here. You can, as you can see, this is, you know, borderline the right size, you know, you go down one one hook size and you're gonna have to go down to smaller, smaller tinsel. This tinsel is like perfect on a size up. So like on a size eight hook, this is exactly what it is. So that, that would work on eights and tens. Okay, so I've secured the tinsel and now I guess there are different schools of thought. There's the school of thought uh, with wing first, hackle later, 
which I've seen in a lot of the pictures. And then there's the school of thought with Hackle first, Wing later. Um, I don't think it really matters. I think it's more a matter of uh, personal preference. Um, I'm going to try to do the um, Hackle first, Wing later, and see how that goes. So I have, again, a prepared hackle. This is from a um, grizzly dyed brown hen neck. It looks something like this. Um, I guess it must have been a good deal when I bought it because it was, as you can see, 16.95 with 50% off. Yay. Um, so. But generally these days, for some reason, if you want a good quality hand hackle, uh, it's not going to be cheap. So yeah, this used to be a very cheap material that nobody wanted. And then all of a sudden everybody wanted hackle and there was no cheap hackle to be had at any price. Anyway. No, it was the women wanted to wear it for jewelry. Yeah, that was for a while. And then that fashion came and went. Yeah, it, it wore it in their hair. They got it woven into their hair. And then yeah, that I think I think what Once what the price goes up, it seldom goes back down. I think there, there are two things really here. One is that whiting is a monopoly. And the second thing is they're shipping all their good hackles overseas for for commercially tied flies. And they don't care about the uh, the domestic, um, you know, um, what do you want to call it? Backyard um, fly tire or, you know, garage fly tire type. Um, and I think this combination of these two factors and at, at that point when the, it was the fashion, I think they found it very convenient to uh, to blame it on the on the people putting uh, putting feathers in their hair. But then, uh, you know, I thought, okay, I, I actually, I was stupid enough to believe it. And then the fashion was over and then the feathers never came back. And, um, and I realized that what's going on is a lot darker and more sinister than just mere fashion. You know, there's always a good conspiracy to explain, uh, to explain what's going on, you know. Anyway. You needed to listen to our conspiracy talk last week. I missed it. I I missed it, but I um, I I do have somewhere a, a book on conspiracy theories. So I'm there. There are some explanations as to why we're so keen on conspiracy theories as a species, I suppose. Anyway, so there is the hackle wrap and fold back. And now I'm going to put on the wing. So I moved my, my thread all the way to the front because this, this polar bear is very nice material, but, and I just have like a little, a little scrap of the stuff here. It's nothing, nothing fancy, right? This is a, this is a small fly. You, you don't want the, you don't want the, the really long, um, the really long hairs. And what I discovered after, after tying a few flies with, with the polar bear is that, um, and I, again, this is one of those materials that's not very easy to find. You can substitute um, calf tail, uh, buck tail. I think it, even some, some synthetics ought to um, or to look okay on this uh, on this fly, and it's not something that I would like to cross any international borders with whatsoever. So this is, uh, I guess, I'll never move out of Canada because uh, I've got some polar bear in my fly tying material collection, and uh, well, I'm not prepared to give it up. Okay.
I'm going to put this in a hair stacker because these these fiber tips are not very they're not very well aligned. So I'm actually I have a I have a hair stack, stacker with a really fine uh, finely tapered funnel. Um, I really like I really like this one. It's a it's a Tiemco uh, hair stacker. It's solid, heavy stainless steel. And here are my aligned hair tips. Grab this out of the out of the stacker and now give it a good measure against. So what I'm aiming for is to about the halfway point in the in the tail. So cover the body and, and just a little bit extend into the tail area. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these uh, hairs. And I'm going to trim them first, because if I don't do that, nothing is going to work. So I'm just going to trim these. And I've tried to trim them at an angle and all sorts of things. Uh, it doesn't work. This is slippery and stiff at the same time. So the only thing that I found worked for me was this, just lay these things right on top of the hook exactly where you want them. There's going to be no further trimming. And as you can see, it springs back, right? So I try here to grab with a thread and just really tight wraps and do the, the head of the fly and attach the hair at the same time. Okay? It takes a few turns, but that's okay because it's not, it's not very easy to to attach and there is the head of the fly and the wing put on it's at a bit bit of an angle which is i find a lot harder to to achieve if i tie it right up against the body i guess my bodies are a little too slim to to push the wing up but with a hackle on there i get kind of a good angle in the head and then i do two whip finishes and it's done and that's the fly okay so relatively easy and the variations that i i read about so other than you know varying the varying the materials here uh, there is a variation where you you skip the hackle and you just have the polar bear wing and a couple of strands of crystal flash just give it some flash. And then there are versions with the rib and without the rib. So you kind of have a choice as to how much, how much flash you want in this fly and, and the choice of materials. Okay? And that's the American Coachman. There you go. This is my part of my project of building up. A, I'm doing two things here. I'm, I'm, I'm building up a fly box for uh, Siran cutthroats. And um, I'm also doing the research in the meantime to glean some of the information on fishing for these beasties because it's, uh, there is some, some information out there, but it's, it's not an awful lot, and it looks like I'm going to have to wear a few pairs of wading boots and spend some quality time uh, researching beaches and tides and all kinds of things. So, so Florin, that's a pretty skookum hair stacker you have. This is the one that I've been using lately. Um, that's probably had a couple of thousand flies put through it that used to belong to Roman Sherevin. Mm. But one of my one of my pride and joys is holding one of my old friends' hair stackers. Yeah, no, oh, that is just from a just just from a store. But I um, this this and I laid I I laid the blame here uh, at at Charlie Craven's feet because he has some of these Spiffy Tiemco uh, stackers in in his book, and so I was like, 
okay, you know, the guy makes a case for, you know, you, you want good quality work, you use good quality tools. And I experience little as I have shows that, yeah, that's, there's a lot to say about that. And uh, Florin, Florin so, just, just to comment, you're saying you're going to have to get into sea run cutthroat trout fishing. I yeah. think you were at the, uh, by uh, Zoom uh, at the Island Waters fly fishing where Dave Clough gave his presentation. I was, yes. Do you remember that he said February the 15th is the height of the sea run cutthroat run up there? What day, what day do they spawn on? February 15th, I remember. <laughs> I know it's Monday, but you know what? On Sunday, I'm going to get my 100th consecutive day of cross-country skiing. Oh, <laughs> nice. I am, <laughs> you know, and after that, the question is, how far, how many more days can I get in, you know? Uh, yeah, so. Um, Farn, you, you could do it here today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought it, it never snows in Victoria. And then when it snows, you don't go out. You just wait for a day. And yeah. wow, Dave, that's your, I mean, you're so close to the ocean. That must have been a, a serious, uh, a serious dump because normally if you're that close to the water, you don't, you don't get much snow. Well, Florian, good... right now you can do your cross country skiing and fishing at the same time. I know. I thought about doing that. Um, there, there is a place here where you could you could do that if you wanted to. I think on the Athabasca. Okay. If you go to Jasper. Yes. In, um, go early April, early to middle of April, and um, there is there is enough snow on the banks that you can probably strap on some skis and uh, and and have a go at it. The the challenge that that kept me from from ever attempting this is well it's a good idea to have waders on because even if you just get close to shore to to take a fish you know to the net you have to put your feet in the water yep. so how are you going to do waders ski boots and you know kind of like it's a little too much gear to carry around and then you get sweaty skiing and then you stop for the fishing, mm. so I I never did that. But in theory, I guess somebody could work out a way. Hey, Florin, it, it's Mick. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, with regards to fly fishing, coastal cutthroat trout, um, Les Johnson's book is is a classic by Les Johnson. I have it. Okay. And the other one, just for historic. Um, research is actually taking a, a look at Roderick Haig Brown's The Western Angler from uh, way back when. You may have that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to see if I have that. I probably do. Yeah, well, they, 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 they both got good tips on flies, even though they're written uh, decades apart. Right. I, I think I have both, both of those books. Yeah. And um, as Michael mentioned, I was in that, uh, I was at zooming into that cutthroat talk by Dave Clough. And at, at the end, he, he addressed the audience and said, uh, you know, you only need two flies for this is the American um, coachman and the rolled muddler. So which one, you know, and the fishermen are two, two kinds. They're the American coachman ones and they're, the, the modeler ones. So who's in which camp? And it was funny because some people just put up one hand, you know, like American coachman types. Some of them were like modeler types and some guys went both hands up, you know? So I was like, okay, well- you remember then. what Dave uh, voted for. He voted for the American coachman. And he was an American coachman guy. He said, that's, yeah. all, that's all you ever- uh, that's all you ever need. But I like the I like the pattern. The rolled muddler is an interesting pattern, yeah. and um, I want to do that. Uh, maybe not next. I mean, I'll 
ask you guys whether you want to do that one next or or we go and do the Peter Ross and come back to the muddler after. Uh, but let's do the let's do the muddler. Uh, I I'll do the hard one, which is the uh, regular muddler because it's got a, a flat turkey wing. You can do the rolled one. I do the rolled <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I've never I've I've never done that fly, so it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, it's been a while since I've done one, but it'll be interesting to try. Well, okay. I was I was monitoring a camera in the mill stream uh, earlier this year. And we had three or four sea run cutthroat come through the camera. So there's a spot to think about at the mouth of the mill stream. And then I was over on Saturna Island delivering eggs about what three weeks ago. And uh, the fellow who runs the hatchery there was telling me next time, bring your fly rod, you know, take me down to where there are. And this is his quote, there are lots of sea run cutthroat waiting for you. <laughs> so there's a place to go in Saturn Island. Yeah, and there is a winery on Saturn Island, <coughs> if it, I remember it, correctly, it, right? It's it's been closed for um, a few years, but this year one of a one of the richer Alberta oil sands brothers have taken it over. They took eleven tons of Pinot Noir grapes off it this year and ship them to the Okanagan to process them. But they expect to have the bistro open next summer and the uh, winery in production. So oh, wow. it will be a destination. They wines. They used to make whites over oh. on, on Saturna. There were some, um, I remember drinking them. Uh, there was this shop I was really very unhappy when they closed. Remember the old VQA shops? Yeah. And yep. there was one smack downtown, like a couple of blocks um, away from the Empress. And the guy yep. who ran that shop was super knowledgeable. Um, don't remember his name. He was a jolly fellow. On, is that the one on Pandora? Just south, uh, of, just, just past Douglas? It was between Douglas and government on one of those yeah. side yeah. streets. Yeah, yeah. And I think there is about. a wine shop there right now, but it's not <laughs> no. nothing to get excited about. Um, and so this it's guy wine. knew his wines. And if you went in there and if he started to know you a bit, he would start to pull stuff from under the counter. There, there's... Two, two, two comments. One is that the demise of those VQA uh, shops, that was attributed to Jimmy Patterson, who basically really? forced, yeah. He yeah, basically bought the company and forced them all. Surprising. And, uh, Why? So how, how could- uh, well, cause, he, Cause he has the save on wine, save on liquor stores. He didn't uh. want the competition. <laughs> so he drove those guys out. Because no. I, th I thought that the reason the VQA shops closed was that they basically had achieved their, their purpose, which was nope. to popularize the, the, the BC wines. And at some point, you know, they were successful enough that they felt, okay, the brand is well established. We, well, we, we knew that we, we, knew, we used to shop at the one that was on, uh, on, uh, uh, Cabro Bay Road, or no, it wasn't Cabro Bay. I guess it was. Uh, well, the, the one in Fairfield there. The next one over, no, it, it was uh, Cook. A, across across from the the little deli place. On, Foul Bay, Foul uh, on Bay Fort, Road, uh, Dave. On Foul Fort. Bay. Foul Bay, yeah, on Foul Bay, yeah. Yeah. So we we talk, We used to buy wines there and talk to the lady when they they were going out of business, and she said, "Well, no, it's Jimmy has forced us out." So she now uh, works or is part owner of the one, the liquor store down in, uh, on Cook Street. Uh, mm. And the other place that, that carries a, a fair good selection of wines is the called Vintage uh, Liquors. It's right across the street from City Hall. Oh, okay. So they're, they're two decent, those two stores are decent wine stores. They will carry a good selection of decent BC wines. 
Well, now the superstore has, um, I was, um, last time I was, I was in the, in the area, I was buying Geringer Brothers Riesling mm -hmm. at the superstore in Langford. And I was like, wow, I mean, that is excellent Riesling. And um, basically, I think B BC liquor stores are kind of dropping the, the stuff that that the superstore is selling. Yeah, we, um, we'd go to the Wine and Beyond place. There's a couple of guys there that know their inventory real well. Uh, and and they, they have not steered us wrong yet. Mm. They went out in Langford. Yeah. Yeah, I have a developed a few favorites over the years and, and Geringer has been a consistent uh, high quality, high quality Riesling. You ever add a little cassis to your whites? Uh, to bubbly, yeah. And I I buy a try to buy a dry Pinot Pinot Grigio, and then uh, put a tiny bit of cassis at the bottom, and then pour the wine. And it just makes it lovely. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Have you tried it with prosecco? No, no, but I will. Yeah. That's uh, I don't I don't I don't need too many excuses to experiment with wine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you ever want to hear a story about the Geringer Brothers winery, I can tell you an amazing one, and it involves 